Yeah, I mean, I just want to, I really just want to say, you know, today we're going to talk about ed tech and the reason why is, you know, one of our listeners, a, a, a gentleman named Ken from Taipei, obviously involved in education and technology um, in the region, was just interested in finding out more hmm. about it. And I have deep inroads in here. We'll talk about some of the companies that I know about later. But um, yeah, I just want to thank Ken for, for his support. We'll thank him again at the end of the show. But it's a good topic, I think, to discuss. Yeah, right. So ed tech is big in the U.S., isn't it? I mean, let's put it into context with some of the uh, the ed tech giants that are there. Who do we know? Well, let's just run few. Let's just run through a few of them, right? I mean, Udemy, Coursera, Khan Academy, and I guess the elephant in the room is there, but kind of gone now is Lynda dot com. But I, I like to talk about this at least initially in the context of just how much money they've raised. So what yeah. the commitment the market's made to just supporting these companies. Udemy has raised $173 million, six funding rounds, they've got 17 investors. This is a company that's been around since 2010, and this is really just like a catch-all, we want to teach everything to everybody kind of company, and they've done a really good job at it. And if my numbers are correct, I think they've got something like 15 million students. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot of students, but to be fair, you know, to be fair to the market in total, 15 million students is a lot, but globally, you know, if that's if that's their target, you know, I think they take a, a decent chunk of it, but there's way more growth out there, I think, not just for them, but for everybody else that comes um, and does this with them. And then you have Coursera. Coursera's taken a slightly different tact and raised almost as much money. I mean, I would say it's at least in the same neighborhood, right? About 146 million, same thing, six rounds, 13 investors. People care, and they're taking a little bit of a different tact on this, right? What they've started to do is they go to existing universities, and they try to help them put their courses on online. Um, and they're based, like, right in the heart of Silicon Valley and Mountain View. But again, I mean, they claim to have universities all over the world. They have thousands of courses. And they also have millions, 20 million users, they say. Hmm. So sli slightly bigger, but I think all of these numbers are kind of about numbers. But just again, just to give you a sense, there are probably some duplication between what Coursera is doing and what Udemy is doing. But still, you've got 20 million people at least between the two of these companies going out and, um, and, and taking courses there. And then Khan Academy is really – Khan Academy started off being funded by a grant, mm. which again I, I do find really interesting. And overall I really has not raised nearly as much money as these other companies. And apparently everything that Khan Academy does is for free. Yeah, right. And their idea is that – Anybody can use this, whether it's a teacher, a student, your mother, your cousin. Anybody can have access to it, Khan Academy's teaching. And they've raised a really small amount of money, but their profile is really high. I think they've raised a little bit over $10 million. Their profile is really high, and they get a lot of people kind of leaving full-time jobs to go work at Khan Academy to help them. In, in the end, education ends up being a social good for everybody. Right. Well, you can argue that and I don't want to go here, really, but while you can argue that there may be politicians who would prefer uneducated masses you, it, it, in today's world, you know, obviously being educated benefits everybody, but you can't stop the spread of knowledge. It's just not going to happen. Hmm. And that actually one of my favorite companies is a company called Lynda.com in the United States. And, and Linda has literally been around since 1995. And the company itself was bootstrapped until 2015. No, 2013, I believe, when they started raising money. Um, and they raised over $100 million was their first raise. Wow. They, yeah, wow is right. I remember when I first heard about it. Linda used to be one of these companies that um, it was advertising on other podcasts all the time. Yeah, right. And I remember one day just logging in and looking at what is Linda.com, obviously spelling it incorrectly the first time because it's – a woman's first name, and it's actually spelled L-Y-N-D-A, not L-I-N-D-A, as you would expect. Um, founded by a husband and wife team in, in the United States, and they've been around since 1995. They finally funded in 2013, took a little more money in 2015, and then they were sold to LinkedIn for a billion and a half dollars. Mm. But again... You're talking about four companies that combined have raised over a half a billion dollars, one of which was sold for a billion and a half. There's been a really large commitment to online education in the United States, and it's in all flavors. 
right? Lynda does this thing where they'll update their courses. If they're teaching an Excel course and a new version of Excel comes out, they'll update their course right away. And they'll have experts in those fields do it. I believe the same thing that um, Udemy does. Coursera, obviously, we said, takes a different tact. And Khan Academy teaches from their own perspective. Um, there's a lot of math and science being, being taught at Khan Academy. But again, everybody's doing this um, in a slightly different way, and everybody's getting funded. So there's been a big focus on it there. So then you ask yourself if it's a really big deal in the United States, does anybody care about it in Asia or really in Southeast Asia? Does anybody talk about it? Um, and the answer to that is yes. And it might not be um, as sexy or as talked about as some of the other sectors that we've discussed, whether it's you know, e-commerce or logistics or fintech. But I don't think you can have any of those other sectors without a strong education sector. And I would say the biggest proponent of this is a team out here that's called EdTech, De EdTech Asia, excuse me. And they've been at this actually for quite a while. A guy named Mike McCulloch is actually famous is the wrong word, but he's quite well known. And he has spearheaded a whole bunch of community building around education, technology in Southeast Asia, and he deserves to be lauded for this. And in the same way that companies like E27 do Echelon, that Tech in Asia does their Tech in Asia events, um, Mike has been doing the EdTech Asia Summit for a few years now, and actually has one, does it every year, right? Has one upcoming in Vietnam in, in July, the end of July, 2017. And he and his team, right, Tong, Ed, Sato, Mac Ling, and Quincy Tanner, you know, they've been working really hard to make sure that this, and I use the word niche not to mean small, but just to mean, you know, kind of like a subsector of the event business. And they've done a really good job of organizing around this. So kudos to them. But that's just the beginning of talking about this topic, I think. Right. So let's back up a little bit and have a look at that whole topic. What's driving it? Is it that the education system is broken and that these platforms are filling in the gaps? Or is it that, you know, people just have this passion for learning and they're sort of fulfilling that online? What's the real sort of main market drivers here? Because I'm curious, because I'm also then curious to know how that translates to Asia. Yeah, so I think what you're seeing is what I'll call the democratization of, um, of education. And I think you're seeing it happen online and offline, and I think it's really great. So you see universities like Harvard and Stanford that have massively large endowments finally coming to their senses and saying, with billions of dollars of investments and us essentially being on some level a hedge fund that invests some of our 20, 30, 40 billion dollars of our endowment, and we make money every year, Everybody who is intelligent enough and qualified enough should now be able to learn for free. And I think part of the impetus for doing that is not just to um, not just to be nice to everybody mm. and not just to be benevolent, but they see some competition coming from companies like Udema and Coursera and Khan Academy that can teach anybody anywhere in the world at any time. And I think this democratization of education is the driving force behind this. And that is all you need, again, is an Internet connection and you can get educated. And you know, there was an article which we'll talk about a little bit later about the culture of learning. And the same thing happened you know, a century ago and that is you had people get exposed to mathematics books, teach, teach themselves math um, without really a teacher around. Mm. Although teachers are important and I will not make the case that educators themselves are not important. These are very important people and also very dead. Once you get the information to people that might not have access to it, you'll find that there is a real um, a massive increase in knowledge in places where it never existed before. And in the end, I think that benefits everybody. Mm, right. But I think that's what's driving this. This whole concept of you have access to an internet connection, you can now get educated regardless. And, and that was not always true. Do you think any of this as well is the, you know, some kind of shift away that maybe this new generation coming through don't see the degree as the be all and end all of their, you know, their education. I, you know, I'm looking at the courses that are on Udemy or Coursera. Well, Udemy in particular, they're, they're not degree like courses. These are just sort of, you know, learn how to, you know, build an email list, that kind of thing. But are we sort of seeing that, that people are maybe saying, well, actually, maybe I don't need to go to university. Maybe there's an alternative. 
Is that, is that sort of the democratization that you're talking about? Absolutely. And if you go through and look at a lot of the courses that are being taught, you know, do you really need to go to a four year university to be the best UI or UX designer in the world? Right. Do you really need to go to a four year university? You should learn about computer science for sure, because there is a science behind actually developing um, new services and, and actually writing code. But is that a four year course? Is it a six year course? Do you need a master's degree to do it? I don't think so. And if you look at the education system as a training ground for work later, I think you're finding a sea change in the way people perceive um, the necessity to go to a four-year institution and even to receive a degree. And what's really interesting, actually, is that you'll notice that over the past two or three years, some of these companies like Udemy, um, Coursera, and Khan Academy will actually issue certificates. Right, yeah, saying that now. Right, so they can't call it a degree because it's not um, it's not sanctioned by whatever the education ministry is. But they'll say this person successfully completed this course, and in the end, that's starting to have gravitas. It's starting right. to matter, right? And that you make an excellent point. That is starting to democratize it, the right. the education, right? If we start to see those show up on resumes, then we know that that's being, <laughs> you know, that's, that's the well. Here's the, here's the thing, right? I mean, what what would happen? If your daughter came to you, I mean, you know, I don't know what your plans or her plans are for the future. If she sat down with you and said, hey, dad, I don't want to go to college. I don't want to go to university. You know, yeah, um, don't don't care. I would I think the most important thing that happened to me in university besides getting an economics degree was just becoming socialized as an adult. Right. Yeah. OK. And for the reason why that was important for me was because I grew up in the suburbs and there was not a lot of interaction with um, high intellect. I'm going to get take a lot of uh, flack for that, but <laughs> we know what we're saying. Up, but also, but also, the experiences of a normal 16 or 17 year old in the suburbs are very different than the right. experiences of a 16 or 17 year old who lives in a metropolis. And you know, my daughter's lucky because she's grown up in two gigantic cities, has been exposed to a lot of sort of adult style experiences. And if you look at the way kids that grow up in cities behave, I feel like they're way more adult than they would be if they grew up in a small town. So for her, that that level of socialization, I don't think is really necessary. And to be fair, a child these days doesn't necessarily need to decide to be a doctor or a lawyer to have impact. And barring that, I honestly don't care. Like, right. I really don't care if they if they go to university. Now they should learn and continue to learn for sure. How that happens is really up to them. Exactly. And we can guide them in the right direction, but I don't think it's necessary to go to university. Right. Yeah. Very interesting. I wonder how that translates to Asia, Michael, because you've got this I mean there's a culture in Asia where especially in places like China where the elites, the middle class that growing middle class want to get their kids educated abroad, send them to Stanford, get their computer science engineering degree. You know, for them, it's pretty much a guaranteed track, isn't it, that they can follow. That's how they can escape that sort of one generation of wealth. And, you know, they can create multiple generations of wealth further on by getting their kids educated and so on. That's how they see it happening. Obviously, this doesn't sort of come into their story, right? I mean, these kids aren't sort of growing up and then saying, right, no, I'm going to go and do a a degree on Coursera, right? Their, their parents are still pushing them. They, you've got to go to Stanford. You've got to go to Princeton or wherever it is they need to go, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think the short answer to that is yes. But what's interesting is what's happening is that the kids, and I'll call them kids, right? The kids that actually end up having the ability and the means to go to university in London, in Europe, in Australia, or in the United States, they'll come home and they'll look around and say, I was lucky. And the best, one of the best ways for me to give back to my own society is to then go and democratize without waiting for everybody else to do it, to educate the rest of the people that weren't necessarily as lucky as I was. And there's, you know, I think for all of these successful online businesses, and I'll use two examples really, right? Skill Lane is the first, and again, full disclosure, I know the founders um, I mentored the company at the beginning and I helped them raise their seed round. But their idea initially was they went out and they did a ton of research when they were, were getting their master's degrees in the United States. Okay, so both of the guys that started this company 
were educated locally for their bachelor's degrees and when they went to get their, their MBAs, their master's degrees in the United States, I believe they went to Kellogg, right? So two really smart guys. Um, they went and did as one of their projects a study of the online education businesses, um, not just in the United States, but globally. Mm. And they tried to take the best of each one of those things and fit it into what was going on in Thailand first and then into the rest of Southeast Asia. These are two Thai gentlemen. And what they found was a really receptive market to things that were popular here, right? So they made a decision at first and said, most of the people that are taking jobs in Thailand don't necessarily live in central Bangkok, but that's where most of their employment is. So but there's not a lot of training on the job. So they need to learn how to use Excel. They need how to learn how to use PowerPoint, but they also need to learn how to interview properly and they need to understand how to be socialized properly at work and also how to dress properly. Mm. And they went and built a business around serving some of those um, courses to Thai employed um, kids in, in, in their 20s and they found that that was really popular. It, what they really found though was that a lot of these offline seminars that were being offered to teach just those things were kids that were coming in from the provinces into Bangkok. And they said, look, we want to build a platform where people can learn about anything at any time. And the best way to do that is online. And once they started building the platform, so they film their own videos, they edit their own videos, and they also hire their own teachers. Um, they then went out and said, what else is popular, not just with Thai you know, millennials, but with their parents as well. And one of the things they found was that stock trading was really popular. Mm. Right? So in the same way that coding was the first way, not the first way, it was like an, it was a really strong inroads for some of these online education companies in the United States to attract a certain audience. What the Skill Lane team found was that if they could teach people how to trade stocks, not just on the local exchange, but globally, they could get a lot of interest. It was a way to get people on the platform. Right. So they did a really good job of using a company called Stock Today, which had a very strong offline seminar business and helped them build an online business as well for their stock trading seminars, but also were able to use those people as well to teach them other things besides just trading stocks. And they've seen that become actually quite popular. And one of the things that we discussed initially was with them was get people on the platform first prove the point that you understand actually how to educate people how to get teachers on the platform and then if if your thesis is correct and i think it's been proven to be correct um go out and then do internal training white label maybe or even not white labeled branded your own inside every big bank every big insurance company every big um multinational company Again, starting in Thailand, but with the eye on the rest of the region. Um, and then use your platform to do internal, take it away from them. Mm. It's, again, a, a Trojan horse to get into these companies, but take their training away from them internal because they don't have the resources or the knowledge to do it and build the platform online. So the people that work, and I'm going to make up names of companies, right? I mean, they're real companies, but I don't know if they're using the platform yet. A company like Siam Commercial Bank or um, your Cascorn bank, you go to them and you say, I can run all of your internal training. And why this benefits you, it benefits you because it means your employees do not have to be in your office. And it doesn't even have to be Monday through Friday. And we can build a platform in, um, in concert with you. And then they can learn things to make themselves better employees. It's another perk you can give them any time of day or night. And what they found when they started doing this, um, both for their corporate clients, but also for their individual clients, was that their most popular times, this data is about nine to 12 months old, but even so, I still think it's relevant today, that what they found was that their most popular learning time was sometime between 9.30 and 11 o'clock at night. It's mm, interesting. Very, right? So yeah. again, their thesis seems to have been correct. People yeah. do want to learn. They want to understand better how to get ahead at work. But the companies themselves don't have the time or the resources or the knowledge to train them. It's a real pain for the company, isn't it? They, they don't want to have to deal with this so they can outsource this stuff. They don't really see, you know, that they're getting any benefit about running those courses themselves. 
outsource it, get into these companies and take all the relationships, right? Effectively. Yeah. Basically. And again, what it, what it does for skill lane, if they brand it properly is it allows them to create a one-to-one relationship with the employee, Mm. not just with the company. And what that means is that when that employee switches jobs, they remember who trained them and they'll go back to skill lane for more training. This is the, this is the genesis of that idea. And because it's still early days, the company's only been around, I believe for three years. It, you know, the, the jury is out on whether that's actually happened, but the idea itself I think is really a good one. I'll be interesting to have a look at the, you know, the, the actual data on this. My gut feeling would be that when it comes to learners, you, you're either a learner or you're not a learner. And it seems to be that, you know, the learners understand the value in self-development, self-education as a lifelong thing, right? They're, they're willing to invest in themselves. You know, they don't have any issues about paying $10, $100, whatever it is for a book or a course. Or, you know, they see that as an investment, whereas a non-learner will never spend that kind of money. And yeah, yeah, that seems to be a polarized market, doesn't it? Absolutely. And again, you, you make a great point, and that is the value that the learner sees in actually learning something new is, is exponential. That value is really high. And for a person who doesn't want to learn anything, even if it's free, they still might not right, go and do yeah. it. Exactly. Right? Yeah. It's, it's a really good point. So it's curious to know how that translates to the Asian market. What kind of consumers, learners do we have here? You know, because, well, you know, if you've got a, a market of learners, you've got a massive market because there's a lot of people and there's not a lot of platforms out there like the ones that you mentioned, for example. Yeah, I mean, we'll go through later, a little bit later. There are a bunch of companies, but a lot of the education platforms here, again, because of the reputation and because of the way that the family structure works in Asia, you know, a lot of that education is actually focused on children. So there's a lot of competition in the market. Tom Crew is a, is a good example of this. But there's a lot of competition in the market for, you know, how to teach your six or seven-year-old to right, read English yeah. or learn Mandarin, right? Yeah. But and- not a ton of competition in how to teach your daughter how to be better at Excel. Yeah. No vocational stuff. It's all sort of geared towards maybe an entrance exam, I suppose, ultimately, isn't it, somewhere? Yeah. I mean, and again, that's, that's another thing that we talk to the founders about, and that is, you know, governments across the region give exams for government employees, you know, right. both to get in and also to get, um, to get promoted. And there's very little sort of teaching. Like in the United States, we used to have the Kaplan courses and the Princeton Review courses to get into college. You learn how to take the SATs better. Hmm. Um, those companies do exist here, but they're really to funnel Southeast Asian kids into U.S. universities. But there, there's very little, at least online education, for how to get that government job you want or mm-hmm. how to increase your pay scale. So we're working on things like that as well. Interesting. I mean, there's a massive market here in Japan for – you know, online and kids' extracurricular education, which is really all, you know, the Kumon market, the that whole Juku market, which is... Yes. And, and then they have the sort of, on top of that, this English learning market where they have their celebrity teachers. You know, right. And I think it's big in... You see a similar kind of thing in South Korea as well, where these teachers are elevated to this celebrity status, but it's all aimed at effectively, I suppose, junior high school, high school kids, right? Yeah. You know, and I think as well for the, the parents, they feel like, oh, you know, we've got our kid, this celebrity teacher, and he's on TV, he shows up at this chat show. <laughs> you know, it's sort of scoring points, isn't it? Because then they can go and tell their parents at the school what, you know, our Johnny's doing this week or whatever. So that seems to be a big market. I don't see a lot of it, of the other stuff. It seems to be aimed primarily at kids. Yeah. And again, because the idea is if I can educate my child between the ages of like six and 16, then I can get them into a proper university, right. whether it's a great one in my country or a better or not even better, but just a great one in another country. Then I've then I've achieved something big and I can brag to my friends about it and also makes my child's life better. Yeah. Um, yeah. The whole concept of Juku, right? I think we're right. both really familiar with that. Yeah. And again, this 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 education thing is not just in Thailand. I mean, one of the biggest startup and ed tech companies in the region is a company called Topica mm-hmm. in Vietnam. And Topica has branched out. So they do other things. They started off as kind of an English teaching company. 
and they've branched out to like they do some stuff like Coursera, so they will offer degree programs, they do some tech stuff, and they've also taken on the mantle of running the Founder Institute in the region, which I think is really interesting in the context of the other things they do. But again, it's just another um, take on ed tech education, right? So trying to do stuff both online and offline um, to just to just increase the democratization of education in the region. So good for those. And they're based out of Vietnam, right? Yeah. Yep. And they have 1,400 people in this company. I mean, this, wow. this is not a small company. I wouldn't even consider it a startup today necessarily, but it, it grew organically. This was not a company, you know, that's been around for 25 or 30 years. Mm-hmm. It just grew up the same way that Skill Lane is going to grow up. It just people noticed that there was a gap in the market. They filled it, and then they grew into it. So yeah. I, I think we need to talk about them in the same um, in the same breath. And they have that that tie up with the founders institute as you said they they you know that's really interesting i don't i mean founders institute aside but you know, the whole idea of being there connecting education and the startup community in vietnam wow right you know that's boom you right you have a recipe for something very interesting there already right a vietnamese right. company that knows vietnamese startups or vietnamese education helping grow that ecosystem from the grassroots up that's exciting It's really exciting. And the combination, I mean, so this gets back to what we were talking about earlier, right? Do you need to go to a university? How do you really get educated? Can you learn things online that will then get you into a a job is really the wrong word, but, you know, create an an income generating situation for you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of what the Founders Institute, at least in this region, is trying to do. And like you said, you can make whatever comment you want about the Founders Institute, but separate from that, just the idea that they're connecting education itself, online, offline, to the startup community, I think is a, um, it's a quantum leap from where things have been in the past where you just kind of go to university and you just got to go out and find a job for yourself somehow, mm. somewhere. What excites you in all of this, Michael, when you think about EdTech in Asia? If you could sort of summarize it into that, that key top point about the market at the moment, somebody looking in from the outside, maybe somebody looking from the US, what, what really excites you about it? Is it the numbers? Is it, you know, the freshness of the thinking or what? I just think it's the, the, the market opportunity. We're still really, really at the beginning of the development of this. And, you know, while Topica is already kind of a success, you know, Skill Lane and companies like it, there, there's a list of sort of 20 something companies in Southeast Asia that exist in this space. And I think you'll see what happens here is the same thing that's happened everywhere else in the world. And that is they'll grow really quickly along with the market. But as people find ways to get educated online, you'll see consolidation and some of these companies will will combine with each other. In the end, you'll probably have three to four, maybe five players regionally. But the really interesting thing to me is that you're really just at the beginning of of this. And I, I love watching as a company you know, like Skill Lane says, we have a roadmap that could take us 10 years to develop Mm. because from a tech standpoint, there's no way we can build all of this at the same time. And there's a learning curve, right? So you walk into a company, you know, again, like K-Bank and say, we need to be able to help you educate your staff on these things. And my guess is that K-Bank or any other company, you know, the Siam Cement Group or whomever would say, sure, we already have internal training. We don't need you. But it's, and it takes time. It takes time. I was at an event last night, a French tech, the French tech um, event, which was really good. But one of the things that we talked about last night was that building these companies takes time, mm. right? And there's a bifurcation in the funding of these companies where, you know, if you've got a fund that's got a, that's going to fund these companies and they've got a three to five year investment window and a seven to 10 year window for the, the existence of their fund, there's a time limit during which they want to get a return. But, and I think some of these companies, particularly in the education space, you need to build deliberately, I wouldn't say slowly, but you need to build with like an overriding plan and it just takes time. Yeah. Right? Like Harvard didn't become Harvard in like 18 months. They went out and they built the Ivy League with the rest of the companies and look at every you know, great university globally, it took time and I think we're, we're – we're at the beginning of this building here, and that, that beginning to me is all, always exciting. Yeah. It's amazing to see these skill lane guys have got a 10-year plan. I mean, that's refreshing, isn't it? You don't hear that much these days. Nope. And they, and they don't give up. Like, I mean, I'm biased, right? So, and I always like to state what my bias is before we talk about things. But 
um, these these kids are amazing and they're so focused on growing this thing and there have been you know speed bumps in the way and, and they just haven't cared hmm. they just keep moving forward you watch what they do they'll be on tv and they keep going bit by bit to companies to get them on side and it's great it's great to watch do you think um, we'll have a, a billion and a half acquisition exit in asia in the next in the foreseeable future yeah i i, I do i again i think the um the, the exit strategies for these companies has to be, at least in the market's current state, has to be very different than what it is in the United States just because of the market microstructure. And I would say that, you know, if you're lynda.com, you have three choices, really. You can keep funding, you can get bought by LinkedIn, or you can list yourself on the NASDAQ, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of these companies in the U.S. would say, let's do an IPO. And then they go around to do a roadshow. And this happens periodically, Right. And they would want to sell stock to a company like LinkedIn. And then LinkedIn looks at the numbers and says, you know, never mind for the IPO. And they convince the company that you don't want to be part of a listed company because the legal and all the reporting requirements around that are egregious and you don't want to do it. But we're already doing it. So why don't you just let us buy you outright? Mm. And you can keep managing the company. We'll take care of the noise for you. And I think you're probably going to see the same types of things happening here. I mean, there is a massive interest by Korean companies, by Chinese companies, and by Japanese companies to both invest, build, and acquire companies in Southeast Asia, and that is not going to end soon. Yeah, right. Right? Exactly. And they're all, you know, it's an established market. This is the thing, like you say, with Skillshare, the market's already there. People are, your know, companies are already spending millions, billions on these services anyway they're not betting on developing a new market are they so if the investment's going to go into something it's going to go into something which is an established market more than anything else right for these you know japanese korean and chinese companies they are and look i was in japan in the middle to the end of last year and i was talking to some both online and offline education companies and you know japan's a special case right but i think this is actually taking place globally as well outside of Southeast Asia, and that is those companies are seeing their, the growth in their domestic markets slowing down dramatically, mm. right? There's been a big uptake as high, you know, fast internet speeds become more and more common. I mean, you know, people are doing everything they possibly can online, you know, to the extent that those companies have been developed. And you're seeing companies in Japan say, our offline education growth, because the birth rates are low, are declining. Mm. Our companies are still profitable. We can see a future where there's zero growth or negative growth, and they want to come to Southeast Asia. So we've actually spoken to companies there about investing in companies here just to help turbocharge their own growth, not necessarily the growth of the companies here. And I don't think that ends either. That's a, that's a, a, um, a cyclical change that I, I don't think is going to end soon either. Yeah, those are the fundamentals we talked about, well, last episode, a few episodes back, you know, here in Japan. As I know from my son's school, the number of classes in his year, one less than the year above. I mean, that's that's it there, right, staring at you in the face, isn't it? What, is, the, what do you mean? Well, in his in his year, there are four classes. Oh, right. But the, the, the year above, there are five classes, right? And the year above, that's five classes. So what they've done is, you know, when they've hit his year at school, they've basically realize that they don't have enough kids to spread across five classes so they put them all into four got it so you know as an investor looking at the market you're thinking well you know i'm not going to start betting on a market which is going to get smaller and smaller i'm going to go abroad and look for something else where they're still making babies right you know over here is slowing down <laughs> you know, which is not a good sign for the education market you know generally you want to go abroad where it's still you know it's all happening out there Right. And again, you know, the Japanese market has the full swath of um, experience in the education market, all the way from educating kids to um, regular education to um, offline education to skill based education and also jukus as well. But again, your market for that in Japan is going to be declining. Mm. But they do have experience doing that. I mean, there's a massive business, maybe four or five schools in Japan that just teach English or foreign languages. Mm, Yeah. Right. And the rest of the region is going to need that, too. And those businesses haven't really grown up here yet. And th- those are going to move online as well. 
Yeah, we were seeing that. I mean, I, for my sins, when I first came to Japan, I was an English teacher. And the company that I work for, Geos, is no longer right. you know, around. I mean, what they were charging for a one-hour lesson, which would have been about, I think, 12,000 yen, or maybe up to 15,000 yen, which is about 100 bucks, isn't it? 120 bucks, 150 bucks for an hour yep. lesson. I mean, you can go on to italki, yep. which is, I think, a company based out of Hong Kong. So italki is, uh, you know, like a effectively democratizing English language or any kind of language learning. If you can teach a language, you can become a teacher. If you can, if you want to learn a language, you can go on there, become a learner and you can pay probably around about $10 for a lesson. So, you know, that's a really interesting move. So that whole sort of like English language learning market has been completely democratized. And to the extent that these language schools are going out of business. Yeah. I mean, look, you once you get and this gets back to a topic we discussed a, a, a month or so ago. Once you get English language or Chinese language or any kind of education associated with both artificial intelligence and augmented or virtual reality, now you're completely able to replace a classroom environment with an online experience. Hmm. And but here's the here's the other thing, right? That's changing too, and why online really works, right? And we can talk about. You know, I've read an article about how culture is going to impact the way people learn, right? But also the way the school systems have been set up globally, and tell me I'm, tell me I'm wrong with this, but the way that offline school systems have been set up globally, um, both the scheduling and just the things that are taught was really based on an old agrarian society of, yeah, right. you know, you wake up early in the morning, you go to school, you, you know, you learn for a certain period of time, you have lunch, you go outside and you run around a little bit. And you come back in, learn a little bit of math and science, and then you go home, do some homework, try to get yourself into college. I just don't know if the world is going to continue to work that way. Yeah. It doesn't feel like it. Like if I want to learn something new, I, I can start doing it today and I can, I can end it whenever I want. Right? So I know somebody who lives in Thailand who wants to learn and study about, like get a license to be a sake master. It's almost like being a, a sake sommelier, right? Right. You would think that you'd have to sit in, you know, somewhere in, in Japan mm. to do this. And yet you can do it online. They'll send you the sake. You can <laughs> taste You can taste it here. So you have the different varieties of sake. You know, you leave it in your refrigerator, you taste it here, and then you can get a certificate by properly passing a test within a three month period of time. So it's broken up into little pieces. You can do it at, at your own speed and then you can become a sake sommelier. That's awesome. <laughs> sitting in Thailand. But that's the benefit of this because that, that same person who got that license also went to Italy to get an Italian sommelier license. Yeah. Right. And they had to physically be in Italy to do yeah, it. Yeah. And that's only 10 or 15 years ago, maybe 12 years ago. I can't remember exactly when it was. That's a great that's, course, though. I mean, become yeah. a sake master, the comfort of your own kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. Oh, that's lovely. I mean, it just shows you what kind of possibilities there are out there. And I, I completely agree with you about the, you know, the education system in being built on a, a model which is not fit for purpose really today, is it? I mean... No. You know, I mean, when I went to school, they had bells at school, you know, and I think they still do at some schools, you know, where they ring the bell in the morning to nice. get you to all file in and, nice. you know, all that kind of nonsense. And I think, you know, that sort of trained kids to become good factory workers, if you think about it, whether or not they worked in real factories or the factories of being an accountant or a lawyer or whatever it was, yeah. you know, that's what they and, trained us to do, really. I mean, exactly. That, you can't right. train the next generation of workers like that, can you? No, because they're not going to work like that at all. And, and, and again, I, I look at my own daughter, right? And I just, again, you can't really generalize from your own experience, but like, how is she learning things? Well, I'll sit at the dinner table and talk about businesses that I'm <clears throat> mentoring. And I'll talk about profit margins or sales margins and cost of goods and cost of goods sold. And to her, it just sounds like a bunch of mumbo jumbo until she posts a picture on Instagram of some slime that she's made. And maybe we've <laughs> talked about this already. Yeah. And somebody sends her an email or a text on an email. That's an old thing, right? <laughs> sends, her a, sends her a snap on Snapchat that says, like, I want to buy some of that. 
And then she comes downstairs and says to me, I'm making some slime for somebody I want to sell to them. How much should I charge them? Wow. And then we talk about, well, how much did it cost for you to buy all the stuff that you bought? What kind of profit margin do you want to make? And she goes, profit margin. You were talking about that yesterday. Mm-hmm. So if I, if I buy all my goods for 70 and I sell it for 130 baht, then I'm making you know, 90% or 80-something percent profit margin. Mm-hmm. Is that good? That's great. But that's and that's how the learning is taking place, right? She can sit in in a business course and, and learn about that there, but I don't think that's going to be nearly as effective as making something when she's fifteen or sixteen years old and then sell it to someone and making a profit. Right. I mean, that's amazing hands-on learning. That's real learning, though. And I wonder, you know, you go back to you mentioned them earlier, Khan Academy. I think they, I think their sort of philosophy was homework during the day courses at night was it something like that or i can't remember how it worked the fact was you know you went to school not to be lectured to you went to school to learn how to learn yeah because you sat with the tutor or sat with the teacher and you worked through your homework together with the teacher right and then you went home and you studied the lectures at night i mean there's no point going to a school to be lectured to it's a complete waste of time you can do that online right so exactly I, I think with your daughter's example it shows that you know the key there is to train kids how to think and how to learn not necessarily the actual information because then that falls in when they need to know it right she's been exposed to this sort of economic terms and so on oh now that makes sense now that i'm selling slime right right so that's the kind of ideal learning environment isn't it where you can sort of nurture their passion for learning and then they can go home and they can study the lectures online you know, like these guys are doing at skill, skill lane, right? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And actually some of these, some of these international schools are doing a, I was thinking about this earlier. They're doing a really good job, right. Of putting learning for the kids online. Like my daughter had an, my daughter had a, um, what's it called an assignment due at four thirty on a Sunday afternoon. Hmm. Okay. Now, I just – and I remember when we were in Tokyo, this has to be when she was in third grade. So I'm talking like seven or eight years ago. And they were just starting to hand out iPads or – no, that's probably too early. They were, they were probably starting to hand out like MacBook Airs and stuff to the kids so they could do some of their learning online. And I remember they had a seminar for the parents just to learn about it. Now, as a guy who's interested in technology, for me – it just it was a yes. There was no debate in my mind as, the, as to whether this was the right way to go. Right. But there were one or two parents sort of sitting in the back of the room who were just like viscerally opposed. They were so adamant. <laughs> but there was a reason why, and I didn't understand. So hmm. the reason why was because they couldn't separate the fact that their kids were also going to learn about how to watch YouTube. <laughs> right. Right. From the fact that their children were going to be able to collaborate online. Right. Remember, when we were in school, there was no such thing as Google Docs. Yeah. And I cannot stress to you. I mean, I don't know if you, if you see this with your own child, but with your son. But I sit there and I watch like I can sit with my daughter and with other students and I can watch them actually use Google Docs. You can work on it together. That ability to collaborate, not yeah. just inside the house, but with students in other parts of the city to do your homework in a collaborative way is really powerful. Mm. And that in, that in and of itself is ed tech as well. And it's not, doesn't get a lot of conversation because it's not getting funded and it's not a startup, but that type of technology as applied to education, I think is so powerful. And I remember this one father being so opposed to it. And the only thing I could think was if you expose a seven or an eight year old to technology, What's going to happen is when they get to work and someone puts Excel or a spreadsheet or a word processor or something in front of them, it's just going to be second nature. Mm. And that that alone was good enough for me. And I literally have watched my daughter do PowerPoint presentations that are way better than I ever did when I was at Goldman Sachs because she's been doing it since she was seven years old. (laughs) It's amazing. I think it's insanely amazing. But I mean, anyway, I just think that's another part of EdTech that I think is really important. And a lot of people don't talk about it because, again, it's not so sexy. But but I do think it, it makes a really big deal. Right. And the other thing is maybe that, well, not the other thing, but continuing that thought is that that type of EdTech is so relevant to the skills that 
kids are going to need, aren't they? I mean, you sure. know, going into the marketplace, whether they work for themselves or work for somebody else, they're going to need to learn to collaborate and to share ideas. You know, we're living the sharing economy, whatever you want to call it. Collaboration is key. Yet, you know, you put them in the exam room and, you know, if your daughter turned around to the, the student next to her and asked to share notes, she'll be kicked out. Absolutely. So we still have that sort of legacy, right? That, you know, the only way we know of measuring and grading kids is really still based on something which is, I don't know, whether that's relevant to what we need in the modern workplace. I completely agree with you. And I literally did this yesterday. I, I and two other gentlemen with whom I work on some other stuff, we had to put together a presentation to make to some potential investors. And we sat in a room, the three of us together, and we did different pieces of it at different times, all on the same online collaborative presentation software. And it took us two and a half hours to do it. It would have taken me like 10 or 11 hours on my own to do it. And when I was done, when we were done, I literally looked at these guys and said, if I'd had this at Goldman Sachs, I would have been like a thousand times more productive. Wow. And they're, you know, they're 15 years younger than I am. So they just laughed at me. <laughs> But I think it's I think you make a really good point too. In the real world, right? You're never making a decision on your own. Sure, you should understand how the math works for sure. So if someone says, "Well, that's just a ratio," you need to know what a ratio is. Hmm. But if everything you've done up until then is collaborative, shouldn't it continue to be that way out in the real world? I, I would think so. Right. So the problem is just how do you how you sort of make a metric out of it, how you grade it, how you measure it. You know, that's, that's changing the DNA of the education system, though. And I guess these, these platforms are on their way to doing that. Yeah, I mean, look, I think what's going to happen is these kids are going to figure out that there's a better way for them to get educated, and they're just going to go ahead and do it on their own. I mean, I see so many people out there saying, I don't need to, like, I don't need to learn this from somebody else. I can teach myself this. Mm. And sometimes people learn things that are more interested, that they're, in which they're more interested. They learn better on their own. Right? I mean, you can sit there and, yeah. you know, again, it's the same thing. You can bring a horse to water, but you can't make him, but you can't make him drink it, right? And I think that's what's happening a lot in, in the education world as well is, you know, you can tell someone they need to learn about this. Again, same thing. You can say to someone, you need to learn about chemistry and all this other stuff, and they don't really care, but let them go make slime, and boy, they'll learn about <laughs> chemistry. But they will. They'll learn about chemistry really quickly because that's Sorry. all it is, chemical reaction, right? Exactly. It's all relevant, isn't it? So I guess, you know, to the listeners – your thoughts on ed tech and your thoughts on the education systems, maybe some of your own experiences as well. They'll be interesting yeah. to hear, right? You know, you can hit us up with uh, tweets and questions. We'll, we'll introduce the details at the end of the show. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anybody who has any questions about this, obviously, you know where to reach us at Michael Waits and all, all, at all times on asiatechpodcast.com. But yeah, happy to have interactive and, and conversations about this for sure. What else? What else about EdTech this week? Do we have any more news to share? Um, I think, look, I really wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about EdWings. I think it's really important in the context of all the things that are taking place is that there are also people out there that are trying to build social enterprises. So this is not a charity. This is a business that wants to do social good with, a, with an express mission to go out and use technology this is really to help underprivileged children hmm. beginning in Thailand. But again, th this is true for the rest of the region and frankly for the rest of the world. How to use technology to make teachers more efficient in places where teachers don't want to teach or don't want to go or just don't exist. So again, every country has like small towns that are underfunded or poorly funded. And this, this woman, Joy, has basically dedicated her life to building a platform that she calls Edwings. Um, and she already helps a hundred schools in Thailand and she wants to help more, but she's using technology. So she wants to give them computers, give them tech and let those kids learn. Because one of the biggest problems is getting teachers to go yeah. and teach them, but also getting the parents to send their kids to school. And the idea is if you can have an online platform or part of the idea is if you can reach them in non-traditional ways, she's basically dedicated her entire life to doing this. Um, and I think people need to talk about it in the context of, you know, from a social enterprise standpoint. In other words, this is more than CSR, right? This mm -hmm. is someone who's just completely dedicated to using technology in a way that benefits a specific group of people. This is ed tech as well. It's a completely different take than what Skill Lane is doing, than what Topic is doing, with a different target as well. 
but just as just as necessary and just as necessary to get funded too, I think. And <clears throat> you know, this is one of those things where I'll spend a ton of time, you know, with people like Joy who run this company called um, Ed Wings to make sure that they get the right support that they need to because they might not be technologists, but they're very passionate about mm. teaching and about teaching kids. So that, that to me is also really important. How are they using technology to get to these, you know, difficult to reach places? Well, I mean, so this is interesting, right? You can bring a computer to a place and plug it in, but if the school itself doesn't have air conditioning, that computer is going to die pretty quickly. Right, right. Um, and if the teachers there aren't trained well on how to use the technology, that's not going to work either. What, what they're trying to do is they're trying to build a platform that's multi-screen, that you can use your phone, mm. you can use a tablet, that you can use a laptop or any kind of computer and connect it to a teaching mechanism that's either in, in your town or remote. So in places where you can't have a teacher, right, you can have access to courses either live or recorded in the same for the same courses that you might get taught if you were just going to school every day. And remember, for a kid that's underprivileged, it's likely that he or she is helping their parents mm. do something. So they have a problem of time and place as well. And the idea would be to give them technology so they can have access to educators, right? And education materials at a time that's non standard. Uh, I think that's really important and, and really noble as well. But again, there is profit to be made in there because as those kids get educated, those kids can then go on to get more educated, get better jobs. And you just never know what you're going to find when those kids get access to technology. They learn how to code. Mm. They learn math. They learn how to do things they'd never know. And in that sense, you're creating you know, more consumers, better workers, all the things that you're not able to do right now, getting back to that democratization of education that we talked about earlier. I think it's really yeah. important. That's fantastic. Especially if they can use cheap technology. That's the key, isn't it? That, you know, it's got to be something that is accessible by the masses and people with probably not a lot of money to spend. I mean, if they can get it onto the mobile phone, well, they've solved so many problems there off the bat, haven't they? Rather than sort of trying to get computers into every school. Yeah, and I mean, every educated person ends up being like a, a more wealthy consumer. It benefits everybody, for you know, for lack of a better explanation. Yeah. Good, so that's Ed Wings, one to yes. watch out for. We'll put the details in the show notes. Yes. Excellent. Good, what else do we know? What else do you want to share on EdTech this week? Any more? I think the EdTech topic has been covered to the extent that <laughs> um, we possibly can in, in the normal kind of hour that we allot to this Um I think this is a developing story, and I don't think this is the last time we're going to talk about it, but I think we can pause on this for now. Excellent. Shall we leave the listeners with a finally a big surprise? Do we have a big surprise this week, Michael? It's not such a big surprise, but this really made me laugh, and I think it kind of falls into this. Yeah, this doesn't really surprise me that somebody <laughs> do, would do this. So you've got kind of two competing, I would say, online blog platforms in Southeast Asia, both of whom want to be the leaders in talking about you know, tech one of them is called Tech in Asia, again, a well-funded company, and the other is called E27. They run the Echelon business, and you know they, they have a healthy competition. They like each other sometimes. They don't like each other. Other times, they're frenemies, for lack of a better term. And I logged into E27 today just randomly to, to check up on some things, and the top story, mm -hmm. I, I like the headline writers, right? So again, not a big surprise that this headline would be there. Their competitor, Tech in Asia, lays off employees in India and cancels an event. <laughs> Cancelled. Now, to cancel something, you would have had to have like you would have had to have sold tickets. It's like when you cancel a concert, you know, to yeah. a Rolling Stones concert, it's like everybody gets their money back. The reality is that they laid off a couple of employees. They're not shutting down their business in India. Um, and the event itself was just kind of in the planning stages, so it hadn't actually been planned, so you can't be canceled. It's like when Apple cancels an unannounced product, right? Right, yeah. Apple has canceled their car. The Apple car is no longer – well, <laughs> it wasn't there anyway. Like, no one ever announced it. I don't know. This is just – after the, sort of the, um, the heavy conversation of talking about ed tech and all of its benefits and difficulties and you know, cultural benefits to society – this just made me laugh. Right. There's a bit of a healthy competition, but sometimes it spills out. Maybe a bit of a, a spat between these guys. Nothing serious, though. No, no, no. It's like, it's like all in good fun and all in the family. But the best, 
the best thing about this is that at the end of the article, buried down at the bottom, it says, in the same font, by the way, as the rest of the article, disclaimer. Disclaimer, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> you saw that, right? <laughs> disclaimer, just like one sentence, only like seven words, TIA is a direct competitor to E27. Yeah. And I think that's actually the perfect way to end this for today. Like, it just made me laugh. Fantastic. It just made me laugh. Anyway, um, Good another, great conver- another great conversation. I want to I thank again Ken, Ken L. from, um, from Taipei yep. for making a great recommendation to talk about something that um, we used to talk about and will continue to talk about going forward. Um, oh, I also wanted to mention the fact that I am going to be moderating a panel mm-hmm. um, at the Thailand Startup Summit. On March 31st at the Rembrandt Hotel in Bangkok. That's an all-day event. I'll be doing this at 12:30. Anybody that wants to come and participate, there are a few tickets still left. But right. I wanted to make sure that I mentioned that. I like being on panels. I like moderating because it gives me an opportunity to talk to people that I may not be able to talk to otherwise. So that that's a really good thing. What's the theme of the panel? So the the, the panel for me is health tech. Health tech and what the opportunities for health tech are in Thailand to start, obviously, in the rest of Southeast Asia. It'll be made up of two health tech entrepreneurs and two venture capitalists that invest regionally but also have a specific interest in health and technology. And, um, yeah, I look forward to it. So that's the Thailand Startup Summit on March the 31st, Bangkok, Rembrandt Hotel. Yes. We'll put the details in the show notes, but you can contact Michael through the user channels. Also, how do they get in contact Let's go through that again just so people can ping us, let us know what kind of subjects they're interested in and also if they're going to the Thailand Startup Summit as well. So you can reach me on Twitter at Michael Waits. Any feedback you offer, just hashtag it Asia Tech Podcast. Um, you can, and you can direct message me there or you can reach me on LinkedIn in the normal places or just send me an email. It's sure. all good on asiatechpodcast.com as well. Dot com. com, yeah. Michael, fantastic. Good speaking to you. You too. We will pick up and new subjects, new trends, new insights next week.